Hi everyone and thank you again for joining another Academy for Enterprising Girls webinar. This is really an opportunity for you to meet a girl founder and to ask them questions about how they did it. So today's guest is Emma Costa and she is the founder of a not-for-profit called Hello Cass, which is an SMS chatbot that sends support and information to people who find themselves in an unsafe situation. Since its launch in 2019, the not-for-profit or social enterprise has sent some 7,000 SMS messages of support to those in need. So it's great pleasure of mine to introduce Emma. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me and having me on. So Hello Cass, it was the first of its kind when it launched last year. Tell us what exactly is a chatbot? Sure. Um, so chatbots are computer simulated conversations. So you might see them um, if you're like booking or when we used to fly <laughs> you might see them kind of pop up on a on a website for like to help you book something or to, you know you'll see them throughout facebook messenger but it's basically a computer it's basically a computer program that simulates a human conversation so there's not a real human behind it it's it's you know all of the content has been developed previously or uses some machine learning um and yeah you interact with this computer software and what do you make of the technology? Are you seeing improvements in, in recent times? Definitely. And actually, I was very cutting it very fine to this call because I was just talking to um, some folks who are building a chatbot for the government, as Victorian government at the moment through WhatsApp. So, you know, when I started HelloCast, um, it was kind of, I guess it was the beginning of the chatbot conversation, no pun intended, around 2016, 17. And since then, we've seen like a huge improvement in the technology of like in machine learning so the ai component so that could be natural language processing which is the kind of the key um machine learning component of chatbots so that's to kind of that's where the chatbot understands better understands like what you type and how humans speak in a more kind of sophisticated way um hello cast doesn't use this technology and, and i made some decisions around the technology that we use to be quite simple because I wanted it to be um, accessible via SMS and to do anything with AI or machine learning, which also feels like magic, you actually need heaps of data to test. And I simply didn't have the kind of relevant data to test with. So yeah, there's a huge scale and it's kind of one of those things is how big is your budget? And that kind of determines what, what the technology you pick will be. So how does HelloCast work? Yeah, so you, the, the person who's looking for support, so it's for, um, it's support for people for family violence and sexual violence. So if you're looking for info for yourself or someone um, you might be a bit worried about and you're not really knowing where to start, you can send a text message to the HelloCast phone number or, or visit the chat bot on the website, um, which is hellocast.com.au and you start um, you just say hello and you start chatting with the chatbot and it kind of guides you through a series of questions to get a sense of, you know, what kind of information you're looking for and how urgent the situation is. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think our students at the Academy for Enterprising Girls, part of what they learn in workshops and also on the online academy is to identify a problem that exists within their community and then work on a business idea to then solve that issue. Mm. Uh, how did your personal experience shape your business? Yeah, this, it's such a tricky one because it's, um, so, so I focus on social impact. And sometimes I think, like I think, and I don't, I didn't vet this answer with anyone first, so hopefully it won't get me into trouble. But like sometimes I think there isn't always a business model for good ideas, because if you're working in social impact, it's very hard to kind of find the business model that's in a for-profit sense for human rights-based issues. Which I believe, you know, the right to safety is, is it, that's a, a basic human right that we all, um, that we have. So, yeah, it was really challenging trying to come up with how to structure this. And, um, and I think, you know, in my experience, you know, I wanted to use my tech background, use my experience in the actual issue to say this is about first and foremost it's about being empowering and being helpful for people um 
and not, I guess, I, I didn't want to make compromises on the way that we delivered information and I didn't want to make compromises on how the revenue happened because I was so passionate about it being, you know, this, I was so passionate about the ethics behind it. So I think that that's a really tricky, it's a tricky question to answer and I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of it. But basically I think when you're building something, um, it's really important that you are values driven and only you can set your values and you can, um, but coming up with an ethical framework to think through um, and understand who your users are and what their needs might be is I think the way to kind of start is, is the place to start and then work backwards from there. And how did you conduct that research? Did you do interviews with people who your potential clients, like what's your advice to people who are wanting to get a gauge of, of, of their target market? Yeah, so I think that's um, interviews is right and testing and, you know, anonymous surveys. I, just, I surveyed about 300 people who identified as victim survivors um, or, you know, knew someone um, because I think when you're building something that's based on your own experience or something that you know it's it can be it can be um easy to kind of fall into the trap of just building for you and your circumstances but you know we're all different we all have different experiences we've all got um you know there are many truths in this world so it's really important to kind of get an insight into how other people approach um, information seeking or help seeking or how they what their experience has been with a particular issue because it's always different. You mentioned before social impact and, and revenue. What exactly is a social enterprise? I mean that's the, the, the definition of your company essentially. What, what does that mean? That's a really good question because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if anyone really knows because there's no um, there's no kind of financial or tax tool to kind of Art help articulate this, but essentially, social enterprises are uh, businesses or companies, um, companies that are developed for the intent of doing good. So, generally, a social enterprise, and people always shift in their perspective on this, but general kind of consensus is that a social enterprise is for profit but is purpose driven. So, a good example is um, who gives a crap toilet paper. So they're for profit, but you know their whole philosophy is around um, toilet paper. No, it's around um, you know recycling and reducing and, and having this kind of um, donation part of their business and like the not-for-profit part that they do. Um, and you could probably argue that organisations like Patagonia, who do a lot of activewear and, um, and you know, technical clothing, wetsuits, that kind of thing would be a social enterprise because of how they reinvest their profits. Um, and Hello Cass, I suppose, because Hello Cass in the end is a not-for-profit, so I decided to make it a not-for-profit um, last year because that's not to say that it doesn't have a revenue stream, so it's built. Um, I created this revenue, this kind of business model where the revenue comes in through licensing, so licensing the Holocast brands for other juris, other kind of areas that might want to build a chatbot, um, and also the data insights. So we don't collect any personal information whatsoever, um, but we do get a lot of information around this problem, which is really valuable. So there's a responsibility then to kind of do something with this info. Um, but at the same time, this, this is like information about the worst time in people's lives. It's really sensitive um, and I wanted to be able to honour that and do something where, um, which is why the not-for-profit model happened because it's like, all right, I have this info but I feel like it's not appropriate to make money off it. Sure. You want to reinvest to help solve the problem. Exactly. So my business model I thought needed to be not for profit in that sense because otherwise my business model would mean that people have to keep needing help for CAS to succeed. But that's the opposite to my mission. Right. So, yeah. Great. Convoluted answer. I'm not good at short answers. Oh, okay. okay, you don't need to take your time. How, um, I mean, you were mentioning before that 
you sort of began your discussions around using chatbots back in 2016. How long did it take you before HelloCast was actually born in 2019? Like, was that a long process to get it off the ground? So long. So much longer than I thought. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 2016, I was actually working um, in a tech company in Berlin and of an evening I was volunteering in a refugee camp, camp because um, it was during the time of the big kind of diaspora from Syria and um, Germany had left its borders open for whoever needed to get in. So within a year there was like a million people had um, fled to Germany and family, you know, family violence was a big problem in these camps like where people came in with the issue or happened in there. So, um, but everyone had smartphones and chatbots were happening. So I was thinking about how we could use this technology in that context. And then um, I thought, oh, I'll just spin something up, no problemo, um, in the next six months. So that would take me to like mid-2017. And that was just, I was still on brown paper mid-2017. Quit my job, which was maybe not advisable, but anyway. Um, they had very humane um, uh, job. So I can't remember what we say anymore. Um, like job. security or social security. Yeah, like you get like even as an immigrant, I got like seventy percent of my salary, and I quit my job, which was crazy. Anyway, um, so thanks, thanks Germany. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it did take much longer, and for all sorts of reasons, like funding is very hard to get. Um, you've got to test. You've got to kind of when it's something very new and there's no blueprint, you've got to iterate and like you do a little test and you don't build the whole product, you just test your ideas and test your assumptions. Um, and yeah, and then I was just really scared about launching. Like I just, um, and I needed someone, a friend who's very scary <laughs> to kind of yell at me via a phone call and just be like, what are you doing? You've got to, you've got to launch because and I know this, you know, from a tech perspective, we say fail fast, you know. Don't wait until it's absolutely perfect to launch only to realise you've missed something. Like get it out there as soon as you can and learn as quickly as possible and make those changes. Um, it's, it's, you know, when you're doing, when you're working with it in a trauma space, you're working with vulnerable populations or vulnerable people, um, it's really important to, like, be as prepared as you possibly can, but you will always learn more stuff as soon as you go live. So that's a little takeaway. Fail fast is some good advice. How important has mentorship and, and sort of positive and negative feedback been in creating HelloCast? Yeah, that's essential. I think um, particularly as a sole founder, you are constantly doubting yourself. And I actually had a chat with them. Um, a mentor from a couple of years ago this morning kind of just hadn't had a chat in a while and um you know I think it was nice for her to see the growth that I've had and um you know I think in the startup scene there's a lot of talk around you know being a really slick presenter and um having a pitch and you know and that's all stuff that I think I definitely see the value in I find very overwhelming um, I like to be a bit more casual, as you can tell. <laughs> um, I like to do things, you know, I'm a tech person by trade, so I like to do things kind of, I'm not in it for the, for, I guess, from, from the marketing kind of performative side, but I see its value. Um, but I think, you know, my best mentors were people who told me to be myself and were like, you know what, if you want to be a particular way, just make it part of your brand, just you know, do what, do it your way, be comfortable, back yourself, be ambitious um, and, yeah, and and just have, it's, it's too hard to build something pretending to be someone else. So be yourself. And, and I think, yeah, I wouldn't have had the confidence to do that without my mentors. Yeah, that's wonderful advice. What about um, this constant learning? How have you gone about re-educating yourself and, and sort of keeping on top of the ever-changing tech space. Mm. Yeah, it's tr it's funny because I was talking to someone else earlier this week and she's a, a data scientist and she was a CTO of a Melbourne startup 
um, but she's moved to, to the UK. To be honest, the technology, I always say this, when you're building something, the technology is the easy part. Um, that's the hardest part is working on a product. So working out what your novel solution to a problem is. That's hard and that takes a lot of different disciplines. So everything that I learnt in uni from a technical perspective in terms of languages um, is redundant. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and that was, you know, I graduated in 2005, this was 15 years ago, and I don't feel old, but, you know, like no one's no one's using or writing the internet like that anymore, and if they are, I hope you're not paying them. Um, and there's, yeah, there's just so much stuff to know, so you, and you can't possibly know it all, so relieve yourself from that burden if that's what's troubling you. Um the important thing is is to ask questions. I, I, a lot of people assume being a woman as well that you're not technical at all. So you can kind of that's annoying. Never stops being annoying. You've got to find a way to like not get too angry about it because it takes you off the brief. Sometimes you just need to get angry. But you like the best way to be angry is to like be get even and like just show just do the work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ask lots of questions and be, you know, read widely, but don't, yeah, don't let not knowing everything or not feeling like you know everything hold you back because most senior people, most CTOs haven't laid a line of code in however long. They wouldn't be right, they wouldn't know Go. They wouldn't, they might have their heads around Python, but they're probably not writing the, the tooling. So know it, understand what's going on, understand big picture, but, and, but if you're going to be on the tools, find your niche and, and go that way. We've got some questions coming in. Um, one from Alan who wants to know, did having a mission make it easier to take the plunge as a founder? Or are you always keen on starting your own business or launching your own piece of tech? Definitely having a mission helps you through the times when you doubt yourself and you, of which there are plenty and it's all feeling too hard and if you can kind of come back to your mission and be like this is what I'm doing it for you know with Hello Cass it started like I just became completely obsessed with the idea because I just knew it would work I was like I can't put my finger on it but I just know it's going to work and um the time was right that can be really hard as well because I started Goodhood in 2013, which was about social impact tech. But it wasn't much of a conversation. And so um, the time just wasn't right. It was too hard. I didn't have enough money. Um, and so I had to kind of put it on the back burner. But, you know, so to answer Alan's question very loosely, yes, the mission is super helpful. Um, but I also probably always knew that I was going to do my own thing um, quite simply because I'm not very good at having a boss. I'm like, it sounds like you're also very good at, at trusting your gut as well and, and knowing, you know, having that intuition, which I think is incredibly valuable in, in a startup journey. Definitely. I think like have, trusting your gut uh, and having some grit, you know, at the end of the day, like I never, never ceases to amaze me how, how many startups are a slide deck. And they get all this money and they haven't actually built anything yet. So I think what I really learned throughout the last few years is don't hold back, you know, and I'm still learning this. I'll be really frank. Like I'm still learning how to, how to say how ambitious I am. Like I know it in my head, but it's, I still get nervous saying it to people who I'm asking for money from or whatever because I feel like, oh, should I be or maybe I'm not the right person and, um, how, do you, how do you handle that imposter syndrome? Do you have any techniques or tactics that you've employed? Um, it's really hard because it kind of morphs, it kind of comes up in all these different ways. And I've spoken to, you know, women who, I, who have been what I see to be trailblazing for decades, 30, 40 years, and they still get imposter syndrome. I think it's something that we, that is, that we live with. And I think what I've found um, with Hello Cass is 
a way of thinking about it so it's like, okay, I know if I ask for this little bit of money, I can do this and that's really good and that's great and good on me. But, you know, a woman just recently told me, what could you do with 10 times that money? Like what kind of impact? If you're about creating impact, so yes, yes, this is how much you need to just to survive and, you know, be able to do it. But what could you do if you really had some cash? that you could invest in this and, you know, how would that look and what impact would that have on the world? So I think part of it is to um, think about not yourself in it but think about what your mission is or what the impact is and make that your kind of reason for, for doing things because I think, yeah, imposter syndrome is hard. I probably don't have too many tips except for just flipping that, that yeah. way of thinking about it. Yeah, I'd imagine that would be incredibly motivating to have that sort of tangible tactile impact of what you're doing yeah another question here from sophie who wants to know what is your advice on finding a job that is right for you such a tricky question mm -hmm. i think it's like as much as you can and obviously i guess this community is great because people are thinking that you you all want to do something maybe a little bit differently i think i think making the right job for you is probably you know, my advice there. So you, obviously it's hard to do that straight away and I know that. But I, I chopped and changed so many different things. I was a freelancer for a long time simply because I simply because I didn't know what made me happy at work. And I remember doing, a, like I had a bit of a career crisis, probably, I don't know, probably at 30. And I was like, what am I, what do I, when am I happy? Like, we spend so much time at work and we it's like it's such a big part of our identities, whether we like it or not, this is the world we've inherited. You know, what am I happy doing? And I realised I was probably happiest when I was working in hospitality, <laughs> which seemed like not a great use of all of my, you know, technical skills. So I was trying to work out what made me happy in hospitality and I realised I just I like working in service. I like I liked serving people. I liked making someone's night and being a really great waiter or being a really great bartender. Um, and that's kind of what's informed my, I guess, thinking around what the kind of technology I produce is I want to work in service. I want to do stuff that helps people. Um, and it's not totally altruistic because I get so much out of it. It's really fulfilling for me. Um, and, yeah, so that's kind of, I guess, my advice there is, maybe try to find the thing in your life that brings you the most joy and think about how you can put that into a job or cre or create a job for yourself that, that is follows that path. Amazing. So was that sort of, um, did you sit with your thoughts for a period of time to sort of reflect on where you were most professionally happy or how did you come to that sort of identifying that hospitality was where you were your happiest? Yeah, I think like, I remember it, like, very well, like, because I was surprised. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, but I think it was, like, I, I also surf, and that's a really great way for if you have a busy mind, which I'm imagining all of these enterprising girls have equally busy minds, um, you can feel like, I, I certainly feel like, I'm not, oh, I'm not, maybe I'm not doing enough, maybe I've got to do this thing, and I book meetings back to back and I overfill my calendar and all that kind of stuff. And then surfing, I can't have a phone. I can't have a computer. It's like I, I can't control anything. I just have to wait and be patient and, you know, just hang out in the ocean. Having said that, because of stupid lockdown, I haven't been in the water since February. But anyway, it's going to change next week. <laughs> um, I will go to the water. But um, it... During that time, I kind of, you know, spent some time just thinking about, yeah, just things that make me happy. And that was truly it. Like it wasn't any kind of structured decision-making, like no post-its, just like, gosh, that was a really happy time in my life. Because, you know, running your own business, regardless of what it's in, some advance does not make it any easier, but running your own business is incredibly hard. And it's hard because of money. Um, but money is just energy. You'll, you'll, you'll make it, you know, you'll build it. But then it's also, you know, the hard thing is believing yourself and you kind of get to this point where you're like, am I doing the right thing? Is this crazy? 
and knowing when to say no, knowing when to like close your computer and not um, keep working because there's this kind of feeling that you're always having to keep working, um, but then you burn out. So it's very hard. Mm. Um, I think definitely make sure as soon as you can build into your life um, things that allow you to stop and reflect because you'll get more clarity that way. Yeah, and I imagine that would be um, it made even harder with the fact that you don't have any colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it the way I did it. For goodness sake. <laughs> it's really I'm here to tell you. <laughs> I've got a question here from Madeline who wants to know, do you have a female uh, role model, someone who you look up to in the business world? Yeah, in the business world. You know, like I have so many, which is very fortunate, and, like, a lot of them are my mentors. So there's a woman named Manita Ray. She's a mentor of mine. She used to be the CEO of YGAP. She's incredible. Um, there's Jan Owen, who is amazing. She was the CEO, founding CEO of Foundation for Young Australians and also a, a friend and mentor. Incredible. Um, I feel bad now because I'm going to, like, forget crucial women in my life. Um, Kriti Sharma, who's... Um, the founder of AI for Good in the UK. And they have a similar chatbot called Hi Rainbow, um, which works for people by Facebook in South Africa. Um, and these are all women who are fiercely independent, fiercely themselves, and, you know, incredible moments and very, very generous with their networks, with their um, authenticity, like, these are women who um, don't like, are like, don't wear a suit if you don't want to wear a suit. Like, do it your way and a very, yeah, a, a incredible like that. And, I mean, Anita and Jan are both are mums and, like, are busy and, like, have this kind of whole way of doing things. And I love that we'll have chats um, when, like, it's, it's a kid pickup or dog walking, you know, like, puppy school. Like, we're just real work and it's just very flexible and um because the point is you know with the, what they've shown me is the point is that you're progressing that you don't need to kind of form make everything really formal the point is that if you if you work best walking and talking then like walk and talk for your meetings it's fine so yeah i think that's one of the well, Emma, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for chatting with us today. We really appreciate all your insights. And if anyone's at home watching and wants to get some female role models, um, they can head to enterprisinggirls.com.au. So thanks again, Emma, and um, best of luck. Thank you. Thanks so thank much for having me. It's been great.